meeting tonight and uh, want to thank uh, Wichita and Feely and the library staff for doing all the heavy lifting here for us. But uh, we're going to uh, be talking about uh, garden soil preparation tonight and to take care of that for us we have uh, Chris and Sandy Kangla from Christopher's Garden Nursery over in Lakeside and they are the experts. They've had the nursery over there for about 42 years and Chris has a degree in agriculture business management and their father and grandfather have been in agriculture so basically he knows more and she knows more. They've forgotten more than we'll ever know. So, And they're going to give you a high level education tonight when really all I want to know is how to keep the elk from eating my aspen trees. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, they're going to talk for a while, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. So, thank you. Thank Leave you, it up to you. <laughs> thank you for all coming out. Uh, uh, a little bit more of my bio: I was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona, and my entire family went to the University of Arizona, and I went to Arizona State. <laughs> <laughs> And I am the black sheep of my family. Yeah. I have cousins and family members that don't even send Christmas cards anymore. <laughs> but, uh, um, one of my other greatest oc occupations would be uh, um, I was a father and got to raise two beautiful kids, and I've been married to my wife for 33 years. She's worked with me side by side in the business. and. Uh, I started Christopher's Gardens when I was uh, probably 20 years old. I was a junior in college, and I came home. My grandfather and my father were both nurserymen. Came home from school, said that I needed a summer job, and he said, go up north, lease a piece of property, and start. you can use my trucks in the summertime. That's how Christopher's Gardens got started. I used to take, I was an agricultural business management major, but I, uh, I took horticulture classes to pad my GPA because they were very easy for me. And, uh, and I ultimately, thank goodness, I got my degree <laughs> through the car broadside. But, uh, um, this evening we're supposed to be talking about uh, uh, preparing your gardens and uh, um, you're going to get a lot of Chris-isms and uh, um, the reason why, you know, I have things that I've, uh, over the years, um, I, I use and I feel that are they're important in gardening. One thing I do is that I still grow gardens every year. My wife uh, is always chagrined because I grow these gorgeous gardens and if I draw an elk tag, I'm never there to harvest anything. <laughs> so she's uh, uh, usually in the kitchen canning uh, by herself. She gets a little upset with me. But, uh, um, we do. We actually we do a boatload of canning. We're kind of uh, we're kind of old school, kind of geeky kids. We we get a kick out of being in the kitchen and uh, freezing, blanching, canning, and uh, uh, growing great gardens. So I have our gardens. You know, in Lakeside, we actually have pretty fair soil in Lakeside. Heavy clay, um, uh, but. I've raised all of my garden beds, and we have kind of built our own soils. The nice thing about you know doing raised beds is that you can control the soil, and it's kind of uh, once you build your soil up. Granted, you have to kind of augment the you know your soils every year, but it's a fixed asset. You know, once you get your beds growing, you know, doing real real well, then it takes a lot of the pressure off of you. So. Your soils over here, as well, you probably all know, are very, very alkaline, and uh, um, and they're very, very devoid of organic matter. If you were to start from scratch and go dig in your backyard, you'll find that uh, there's very little organic matter in your soils, and, and very calcareous soils. So the age-old deal, this is a criticism, all the organic matter you can get your hands on, i.e. horse manure, cow manure, oak leaves, raking up leaves, um, and I'll tell you there's, you know, everybody talks about pine needles. Well, pine needles are not all that bad, they just don't break down readily. There's a lot of uh, resins in the needle, and if you take and you take pine needles and shred them, you know, run them through a shredder and it pulverizes them real well, I have no issues putting those in the garden because at that juncture they will break down fairly easily. So. 
backing up on horse manure. A lot of us have horses and uh, um, has a high degree of salt in it. Uh, probably not the best. A horse is not a ruminant stomach where it breaks, you know, uh, um, basically cellulose down readily. So it's really not broken down real well. But I still don't have a problem putting it in your garden is what it will do. It's kind of almost like putting sawdust in your garden. Uh, it will tie up the nitrogen. So you have to kind of feed a little bit heavier if you load your garden up with a lot of horse manure. And also be conscious of salt too because uh, 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 horse manure, the urine in horse manure has a lot of salt in it. So. Aren't grubs more prevalent too in horse manure? Pardon me? Grubs more prevalent. Ah, that's a, that's a great one. Thank you, Vanna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny, you know those white grubs that you, I don't know if you've ever encountered those in your garden. Yes. But, uh, um, it's every time that I've used horse manure yes. in my beds at the house, I've always gotten those white grubs. Mm -hmm. And I have no clue, you know, where it comes from, or the, you know, the eggs, yes. I it's see you. The flies lay those on the horses, uh, the hair on their, near their hooves. Yep. That worm goes clear up through there, winds up mostly in their backs, mm -hmm. and then... And bots. Uh, we, it, they... They're, all of their eggs come out in their feces, and that's where they come from. <laughs> Just solved the problem. But, uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, eyes wide open. If indeed you use a lot of horse manure, you can encounter white grubs in there. Pig manure the same? I would say pig manure is probably broken down better. I would, pig manure would be okay. Seems like rabbit manure is good. But, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't either. Other than it's bells to high heaven. Chicken's the neighbors good. Are love I know, right? Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Chicken. Chicken manure. Yeah, actually, we take. Uh, we've got a little pen of chickens. My wife, God love her, doesn't ask for much in life, but she likes a little batch of chickens around, and we've got a chicken pen, and uh, we'll take in there, and, well, semi and well, I mean, maybe every other year, yeah. <laughs> and we'll get in there with a rototiller and just rototill the whole bottom of that pen out and go chuck that in our grow boxes, and it's uh, just good organic matter. It works great. Everybody talks about how hot chicken manure is. It's really not bad. Um, you're looking at 5%. Um, it's not as hot as everybody, you know, alludes to, but I think that because they're concentrated, you know, chickens are, you know, crapping in the same spot, then uh, uh, you go chuck that in the garden and it can be relatively hot, so. How about sheep manure? Sheep manure is excellent, you know. Sheep manure, rabbit manure, even all those alpacas, um, you know, all that stuff. I have no issues with it. In the fall of the year, if you've got the neighbor's trees that, you know, shed oak leaves, get the shredder out, sack it up, throw it in your garden. It's, you can rototill that in, just lightly rough that into your gardens in the fall, and you watch by spring, it's already digested. I mean, it's already broken down. It's amazing how fast it composts. Are we just talking oak leaves and not just random tree leaves? Well, I really don't have an issue. You could do cottonwoods, you could do any of that stuff. It's just, it's organic matter. But um, you might, if you really put a lot of organic matter in your gardens, like in the fall of the year, and it's not broken down real well, you might have to augment by putting a little extra fertilizer in the spring to keep that process going. Because the microorganisms breaking down cellulose utilize nitrogen in the process. So in essence, you've got to feed the microorganisms. <laughs> and, you know, commercially, there's a lot of products on the market that, uh, um, and, I, and I, I have to dig and say that, you know, all products are not created equally, too. Um, we have a tendency of selling on our potting soils, an all-purpose potting mix. That's Black Gold. SunGrow is a company that uh, puts a, a really good product out. Miracle Grow has a great marketing name, but if you really truly crack open those bags and look at it, it's a boatload of mulch. It really is not you know, broken down. This product has a higher uh, level of sphagnum moss, peat moss in it, and it's just a little bit better quality product. I have a, a mulch at our place of business that uh, um, is, if you crack the bag open, it's fall down gorgeous. I'm a stickler what goes under my label. The bottom line is though, 
You can't, you, you, everybody wants to take that home and plant straight into my mulch, don't do that. You still have to mix it 50-50 with soil so that it's not, uh, you know, too strong. One um, of my real kind of favorites and sleeper is this next product too, that's um, humic acid. And I've seen these little buckets of humic acid being sold for like $75 a bucket. and. It's the same stuff that's being mined in New Mexico. Uh, we have it, you know, uh, I don't know what the, it's 30 pounds or something, 20 pound bag, only $17.99. So don't be duped, you know, in uh, buying a small bucket for 50 and $70. Uh, that's the same exact product. How do you use it? Well, it's funny, it has no, doesn't seem to have any caustic qualities. Humic acid is an acid base, but it's like concentrated organic matter. So I, it says like, uh, you know, like a pound to a hundred square feet. I take a whole bag of that and just run it thick into my grow beds every fall or every spring rather, and uh, uh, rototill it in. And I, man, it, I think it really peps my gardens up. So that's a, a good one right now when you're coming into spring. Um, if you're trying to build soils, um, there again, you know, you can build it with. Get your base, your base soils here, and then start putting a lot of organic matter. We sell big bags of um, a soil mix at our place of business that has um, a compost in it, has a, a wood in it, and has a has a manure in it. And we have 75% organic matter, and then we just take a base of topsoil and add that to it. And that's what we market in these big bags and put them in the back of your truck, and you can fill up a grow box with it already pre-done you can take it home and grow a great garden first season in that stuff that we're mixing in our own place and, and bagging what's it called uh, pardon me what do you call it it's just mine it's mine <laughs> right on the label chris is, chris is still no it's just it's just topsoil and uh we just call it topsoil in a bag but it's uh it's not really topsoil it's almost it's garden soil so um, then you can take from there and from that point on every year just kind of keep you know adding to it and you'll, you'll have great grow beds so this one is a, a product that's uh, on the market it's that square foot gardening soil and it's a, a pre-mix and it's a pretty good mix the only problem is is Ta -da! <laughs> I'm a little bit tight with the money. I've, people have said that. I don't understand that. But uh, <laughs> bottom line is that thing's like $15.99. That bag that I'm alluding to, um, it's about half the price of bagged soils. And it's we're mixing it on site. It's a much better value if you can handle, you know, a big bag. Because it's a half a cubic yard. It's one of those big white bags. And uh, um, we just put it in your truck on a forklift and send you on your merry way to <laughs> unload it. <laughs> the, again, another uh, product. This is a fox farm and I, it's all marketing. That's My girls have a tendency of liking it. I don't like that product. It seems to have a lot of wood in it. I have to say the marijuana growers. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm a retailer, I can't help it, but they love it. And I sell tons of that stuff to that, that industry. And it's kind of, years gone by, I used to say, well, what are you using it for? And they'd go, roses. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. I mean, they just go for a list of everybody that's growing roses. And then all of a sudden, now it's, people are pretty brazen about what they're doing. I'm sitting here going, my goodness, you know, it's a, there's a lot of this stuff going on. But so. the price is outrageous. Yeah, the price, the price point, too, is that uh, this bag is what, the 15 No, 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 no. That, we got the one kilo, one point five. Yeah, whatever. That's but, I mean, yeah, the, the bigger bag is what? Uh, $14.99. $14 that's $17.99, and uh, I sell tractor trailer loads of it. I love it. <laughs> uh, I would like to be your marketing manager, and I want to <laughs> rename that Rose Food and double the price. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got to tell you, it's it's funny because packaging sells. There's no ifs and buts about it, and uh, they've got a great marketing scheme, and uh, their fertilizers a quart is like $18. I got to tell you guys, I sell them tons of them all day long 
And it, I would never use it in my own garden. I mean, this is, you can take a, this is kind of one of my pets right here. Um, that's a fertilum blooming and rooting, and it's a 958-8. So it's 9% nitrogen, 58% uh, phosphate, and 8% potash. And it'll put Doug on, uh, you know, fruit on a two by four. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a great one. Great for flowers, great for your vegetable garden. And this is one that I use all the time. Great for roses. Great for roses. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I can't answer that George? question, sir. <laughs> um, being at your... What was the name of that? This one? <laughs> Blooming and rooting. And... Uh, just a great water soluble. Um, this, you know, Fertilome doesn't probably have the national marketing that you know Miracle Grow has, but this is a great product for really just everything. We use it on. So, do you this. use that in the spring? Tell me how you would use that, just for the not like for we, we don't mix well, it with the soil. It's a it's a it's a liquid, liquid. liquid. Oh, a milk jug. Like your vegetables and everything, then you put this on. Yeah, you can just can put it in like water a watering can. Okay. I'll mix up a big old. Uh, a uh, big old tub of the stuff, and my secret weapon is really this. The combination. And I, I put a combination of these two. This is T Rex, and it's the old Sequestrian 138, which is doesn't mean anything to you, but we used to use this in my father's citrus orchard when I was growing up. It's a high powered shielded iron ion that doesn't get tied up by our alkaline soil. So if you use it in conjunction, this is an acid-based fertilizer, one tablespoon, one tablespoon, turns blood red, and it's a great combo for gardens, roses, everything. Yeah, tablespoon yeah, per gallon. And, um, goes a long way. Yes? What do you think it's made out of? That's an iron product, and, and it's just a shielded ion isn't tied up by our alkaline soils, so the plant can actually pick it up. That's all it is. And you mix the two? Mix the two, one to one ratio, one tablespoon, one tablespoon per gallon of water. Is one of the two white book jars a blue powder, nitrogen blue powder? Yeah, actually, uh, I believe they're both blue, aren't they? Yeah, it's just a, a, a dye. This particular one right here, has a real high nitrogen level, but it's an acid base. And being that you're so alkaline over here, your water is alkaline, your soil is alkaline, and not just a little. You're you're eight, you know, <laughs> nine over here. You're really alkaline. So. But you still <laughs> need you, you have me buy something in a bottle shaped like that, but the label's slightly different. But it's mostly nitrogen, and it's blue powder, and right. I mix it up in water. Which, Pro which one of those is it? Did Probably this label? one. Is that it? Could no? be. Yeah, could be. But isn't um, Grow More has one too that we sometimes sell? It could be a different color label. Could be. Yeah. Well, I, here's my point. The stuff in the green and purple bag right there. You you tell me to try that, and my stuff, my plants will turn green instead of yellow. Okay. Exactly. So I do, and I try it, and it works. I put it. I put some of that in a bucket and fill it up with water, and then spread it around the plants. Right. And they they change from yellowish to green, mm -hmm. but it doesn't last for a lifetime. How does it work and why does it work? And I'm not a chemical engineer, but it really works at my place and it costs a lot of money, but it really works. Can you tell me, you use some pretty big words to explain how that works. How do I tone that down? Can you tone it down so I understand It's the uh, bafflum with, uh, you know, why use a big word when a diminutive word would work just as well? Um, What's going on? Well, it's, um, Okay, I don't want to get real technical with no, chemistry. No, well, I'm but, asking you uh, not to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a ferric ion, a single ion, Fe, and a chelated ion is, um, it can't be around nucleus. It's it's a ferric ion that's multiple, so they can't. That's all the way around. Oh shoot, I know chemistry. Here we go. Um, <laughs> and this, it, because you have so many ions, it this it can't be tied up by your alkaline soil and it's, it gives off enough that the plant can pick it up. Another thing too is that if you put it in conjunction with an acid-based fertilizer, it allows that plant to pick it up also because you're, you're counteracting the alkalinity. So we're just I don't know. How did I do, doctor? <laughs> so, so if you, yeah. <laughs> the thing is if you try to balance the pH that the nutrients are more available. 
to the plants. It's easier for yeah. the plants to pick them up. So is it my perception or is it true? When I use the, the glue powder together with that iron yeah. stuff, That's exactly I, right. it even works way better than when I use either one alone. That's exactly yeah. what I just got through alluding to. Oh, okay. it's, uh, you know, if you have, if you have an acid base acid based fertilizer, you know, because it's counteracting the alkalinity, it allows the plant to, it allows the uptake of the, the iron ions. So do use them on the same day. Don't use one this quarter and another one that quarter. No, 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 no. Use, use them in conjunction with each other. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Okay. And here's a here's a great one for over here too. If you have a leaf on a tree, let's say your apple trees, what you're talking about, and you have a dark green vein and a very yellow leaf, that is textbook iron chlorosis, which is your plant is being chlorotic because it can't pick up the nutrients because of your soil, because you have such an alkaline soil over here. Does that make sense? So if you use them together, you wouldn't have that. If you use them together, that's the combination. Yep. Could we just pour muriatic acid around and... And fry everything? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, he sells new plants, too. Yeah. <laughs> and in essence, you know what? There's a lot of home remedies, too. I will actually go to good old-fashioned Walmart and buy jugs of vinegar. It's nothing but acid. And I will run that in my fertilizers in conjunction with this. <laughs> and uh, um, I run that in my greenhouses all the time. <clears throat> I lived in Phoenix for 40 years, and I ran that in my swimming pool, you know, high right <laughs> <clean acid. laughs> So what, what would I, like, what do you dilute high swimming pool liquid acid? How much do you dilute that before you go pouring it around your I'm property? out right now. I'm not going down that road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to be really careful. So, you know, uh, is, is vinegar excar uh, ascorbic acid? Acetic acid. Acetic acid. Acetic acid. Acetic acid. Acetic acid. Yeah. Then, uh, uh, and that's a, a much tamer acid than you know right. what you're talking about. Hydrochloric or muriatic. You yeah. know, those will fry the walls off your pool. That one, if you don't do it carefully, it'll kill you. Yeah, other than that. That's another reason why I don't use it. <laughs> yeah. Do you use a vinegar grape. Pardon me? Do you use a vinegar vinegar grape. Um, a food grape. Food grape. Yeah, just a regular old Heinz vinegar. You can get the thing. You get just a regular vinegar. Yeah. No, okay. Not apple cider. Like no, no, just regular white okay. vinegar. Yeah. White. I'm just using it for the acid. White vinegar. I don't know what help, but your concentration. Well, that's a that's a good one. Don't get too carried away. Um, do, always err on the light side of things. Let's say per gallon, I'd say maybe throw a tablespoon in there, you know, something like that. Don't, don't get real carried away. I, in, a, in a huge tub when I'm feeding a greenhouse, I will pour probably three, four cups into a big tank. So just to acidify the, the water a little bit more. Any other questions? Can I ask, how, yeah. how do you test like your soil pH, just to know like if you're on, what would you mix all this in? Like, you can get little little kits. I can pretty much guarantee you what you've got. You know, right. it's, uh, uh, the, entire, the entire Southwest, I have a soils teacher in college, and he threw the hook in my neck, you know, I said, you know, what about underneath the pine forest up here? And he goes, bring some soil. And we ran it through ASU's lab, and the entire southwest is alkaline. Mm -hmm. Now, immediately underneath pine trees where you have maybe a layer of, uh, you know, organic matter breaking down, you can have a neutral test, but we are alkaline, and our water is alkaline. So, so when, like, after we've mixed all this in, do we need to check it just to make sure we're good? But if we do something, it's better than... Right. Okay. Right. Yes. And you'll just find it. You will just amend it every year, just because it seems to like disappear almost. Yes. You know where your soil went, but part of it's gone. Oh, the wind, right? The wind. The wind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, for the overall growing of a garden, yes. My question is: is what is the ideal acidity or alkalinity? Are we looking for neutral? I think. Or are we looking for what? I would say. What are we looking for? Uh, Six point five to seven. You know. Okay. You know, yeah, so that, that would be ideal. But slightly, barely slightly acidic. Yep, 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 yep. And, and it, if it nudges barely alkaline, we're in a great range. Oh, we're in a great range. Really you know. know, if you're skewed to eight, nine, we have issues. Yeah. So, and your soils over here are eight and nine. So it's just like my ranch. You know, I've got a little place out in Hunt, downtown Hunt. 
And uh, it's, I mean, it's so hard, the soil out there, and it's saline too, so there's a lot of issues. So, caliche, is it caliche? How do you say that's, it? That's a cal... That, that's pure alkaline? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Dang alkaline it. layer. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta work on the boobs. What about Epsom salts? Have you heard about using that? Epsom salts is uh, magnesium. I think it is. It's yeah. magnesium. That's a trace element, and it's uh, uh, it's not the cure all, and it's also a salt. Uh, so use it in moderation. You'll be okay. But you're just picking up a trace element, and it's not one that's, you know, it's not like a nitrogen phosphate or a potash that a plant you know readily uses. I mean, they use it in small, in portions, and you can get. Um, well, they say, you know, if you ever get like a leaf that's starting to get purple, but there's a lot of factors there. Do not listen to this. Uh, but if you're, that's textbook magnesium deficiency is when you're starting to get a, you know, a purple hue to a leaf. But that's not a given. You could have that from cold. You could have it from a lot of different factors too. So with that said, here's a, that's a azomite. That's a trace element, a, a deal you can put in your garden. A lot of these don't leach readily, so once you put them in there, they're there for a long while. That has a, I think it's like, I don't know, 32 to 64 trace elements. It's got a, a huge amount of trace elements in there. That's just a, that would be like a pre-plant that you could put in your garden and, and go. Do you yeah. use it? Pardon me? Do you use it personally? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've got it for you, though. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, in all honesty, in all honesty, um, when I was a freshman in college, and I did go to the University of Arizona for one semester, and I had to grow a garden, and the instructor was my dad's partner in college, and long and the short is. We had to grow a garden, and I went in there, and I opted for the organic garden. And I'm telling you, if you're an organic purist, I apologize up front. I am not. Um, you know, nitrogen, phosphate, potash, or organic compounds, whether it comes from a dead fish or a factory, I have no issues with it. The long and the short is, I opted for the organic garden, and I'm out there with that blood meal and you know, fish emulsion. And I had these crummy little plants about this big, and the kids right next to me had a 1620 ammonium phosphate garden, and they're sprinkling on there. They had broccoli plants. This <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, I'm a quick learner. I'm going, there's some merit to what these kids are doing. <laughs> so I've always been one. I have no issues with putting, you know, 16, 16, 16 in a garden. Um, but I do avoid pesticides a lot. I'm not a one that shakes a lot of pesticides around, you know, because that's just going in your food stream. But I don't have really any issue with... Is that like seven plus. and that kind of killer seven stuff? Seven, that's carbaryl. That probably, that chemical has the lowest LD50 of any of your pesticides, really. And they're coming out with a lot of new ones right now, and I got it. It's very hard to even keep up with them. They came out with a lambda something or other this year, seven did instead of carbaryl, but it's one that's environmentally breaks down much quicker and so. But that's that's a criticism. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> but that's it, you know, just basically uh, you know, I'm I'm proponent of pumping the dog on organic matter to them and uh, I do like raised beds. Um, because you can control the soil. Our soils and our, our beds are, are phenomenal, and uh, we tend to uh, grow a lot of beets. Things I grow, things that we enjoy eating, and uh, so we grow tons of beets, tomatoes, peppers. Well, you, you just mentioned the triple sixteen, and, and you do toss it as a as a frequent. That is true, and it really about. The first of April. I, I don't plant until the tail end of April, or not not even the tail end of April. What am I saying? I don't even plant until the tail end of May yeah. in, in Lakeside. But I will go in in April and I will take a bag of 16, 16, 16, and shake it white, and it would absolutely fry everything in your garden normally. A, it's in the cool part of the year. B, I let it sit there for a month. To right. two months prior to my planting, so I use that as a pre-plant. Is it going to your ground? No, I don't till it in and just let it okay. sit. Yeah, and uh, it makes a fabulous pre-plant. You know, you stick your plants in, and I mean they start going. So, I have uh, 
this is something that I, I also feel real strongly about. We have such a short, finite season that I like to load the garden up heavy and get them moving because I always, you know, I've always felt that you grow a big broccoli plant, throws a big head of broccoli. You know, you grow a wimpy one, throws a wimpy head of broccoli. I like to move my plants early in the season and then towards the end of July, I cut everything off and quit feeding and I, I let the garden come to fruition, you know, at that point. If you keep watering and feeding, all of a sudden, everybody's just happy, and they just keep growing, and you don't let your gardens mature and come so to fruition. So it's a drought, like almost drought it a little bit. A little bit. Well, that's a that's, that's, it's that's a great statement too, because stress. in the fall, your tomatoes will stay green on the vine, and I will take it. I will start stressing my tomatoes, cutting the water back, letting them wilt a little bit, and then they start ripening on the vine. It brings them along. There's a fine there's, line. there's a one kicker in this deal. There's, yeah, there's one kicker in this deal too, is that that's when we get the monsoons. I know. And we yeah. get atmospheric nitrogen, you know. Electrical conductivity gives off nitrate nitrogen, NO2. So you're, everybody goes, you know, wow, man, my garden looks so good once we get rain. Well, we're getting free fertilizer from God. <laughs> and so that you have to kind of counteract too, is that you've got to realize that you don't want to keep heaping fertilizer on them because you're getting a lot of nitrogen in rainwater, and then you've got to try to compensate for cutting that, you know, that water back. Usually by September we start on the cusp of drying out a little bit, and uh, uh, so you can kind of start drying things down. That's usually when our gardens start maturing too. Yes? Do you use cover crops? I've been curious about that. Do I? No. Explain what it is. No. I get wind. I live on the side of a hill, and I get wind so bad, and I'm thinking it'll keep the soil in, but is it a, just a mess? The only time I've ever used a cover crop is I put 125 acres of alfalfa in on my ranch, and I ran wheat ahead of the alfalfa coming in as a cover crop. Yeah. And the wheat comes up fast, started to mature, and the alfalfa came in perfect below it. And then the wheat comes to you know maturation and dies off yeah so so there's not that big magic of it having nitrogen in the soil I, I I'm curious yes and no um, you know oh man I don't explain what big words crop again but uh, <laughs> actually um, all of your legumes beans peas right. you know alfalfa um, they give off there's a bacteria that gets in the root system and they're nitrogen fixing so they will actually give off nitrogen. And that's, yeah. so that's not a bad thing. If putting like a clove or something yeah, like that okay. that you rotate mm -hmm. into a garden, you know. Yeah. So if you had hay bales with alfalfa in them, would you put that in your garden? Well, not? no, it's, a, it's kind of a different dynamic. I know, that's different what dynamic. Is. But um, that actually has a, a good properties. They've done, I've seen a lot of my trade journals talking about using really fine ground alfalfa in place of peat. Uh, a while back we were all worried about you know the peat bogs being over harvested and, uh, mm -hmm. and so they were looking, you know I'm sure that my industry was looking for some an alternative to peat moss. So they were starting to fine grind alfalfa and put that into bedding plant mixes. I have no problem, it, it's, it's fine, but I don't think it's the, the cure-all. And it'd have to be ground fine. I think. would say yeah, just so <laughs> You don't have the, the sticks and breaking down. Oh. Uh, what about wood ashes? Do you have any use for them? Great question. Did you hear that? We've all got them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everybody's got them. good wood ashes. Get them out of your garden. Um, Take them to nut. Throw them in the cool them down. Put them in the dumpster. No, they compound your problem. They'll put alkalinity into your gardens and. Uh, no, you do not want wood ashes in your garden. So there's really nothing you can do with nothing them? Nothing to do, yeah. So I put them in my driveway. <laughs> good windy day, it makes it like shovel concrete. and throw in the air. Let yeah. It the air yeah. yeah. I heard they were good for lilacs, and that's the only thing I've ever heard. No. <laughs> nothing. No, not even lilacs. What? That's it. Uh, the wood ash do to your soil, it makes it more alkaline? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it would compound the problem. Okay. Compound what, uh, an existing problem you already have over here. And we have. I know this is garden. But what is the best grass plant in Round Valley? What do you say? Can I ask that? You can yeah, absolutely. You can ask anything. All right. Well, I, we have a blend that has uh, 
It's a three-way blend. It has uh, Kentucky Blue and fine bladed creeping or fine bladed rye, which is not the old coarse Lynn perennial rye, but it's a perennial rye and creeping red fescue. Makes a great looking lawn. Okay, and you have that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman over here though, um, and he's got a funny name, uh, and he's got uh, buffalo grass. Uh, Loris was his name. Anyhow. Really cool. Came over. He lives over by uh, 27 Bar Ranch. 26 Bar Ranch. Okay. <laughs> I, I embellish everything. My fish were this big, too. Okay. Um, and he had a, a gorgeous, gorgeous stand of uh, buffalo. And it's incredibly drought tolerant, and uh, I was very impressed. So I went out and I stuck some on my ranch just to see how it would do out there. Alkaline, salty, in with my alfalfa, and it was gorgeous. It creeps. And it, that's it creeps. a chillering one, right? Yeah, well, it's it uh, yeah, like rhizoma. Yeah. Oh. Oh. And it creeps, just like Bermuda. Oh, okay. it, it has rhizomes and, and runs. Huh. So, so it stays short. I don't even think you'd have to mow it. You know, it stays real compact and, and short. And this way it's, it's way more expensive than like the long, the long season mix. But yes, dear. It, um, how do you, oh, how yeah. do you so reestablish like a grass in a, um, yeah. a piece of property that's been overgrazed by horses? And it's just coming up weeds. Mm. Mm. I'd probably go right down to ground zero, till it, run it under, and start over again. You know? Uh, you to, what kind of grass would you. For like a pasture mix? Yeah. Uh, can you irrigate it? No. Okay, then there's a dryland pasture mix that has, uh, you know, crested wheat grasses, uh, bromes, orchard grass, and it's a dryland pasture mix. Um, <coughs> And I would not try to tackle the project until we got the summer monsoon, so you'd get a little free rain from above. Um, if you tried to do it in the spring of the year, being that it's non-irrigated, it would be like throwing sand in a windstorm. Yeah. Yes? Are there any particular brands of vegetable and flower seeds that you recommend? Um, you, yeah, by and large, a lot of your big companies are great. Um, they all kind of have to pass state standards. We're one of the toughest states in the union in that uh, all we have seed. We have a seed license. Seed has to be tested, and we're we're actually very regulated. Um, but yeah, I really don't have much issue if any of the national brands. They'll be fine. That, that's a great question for the gardening aspect of it, though. A lot of the varieties that you get on the seed racks, it's it's the typical, I hate to say it, but it's a typical Home Depot commercial kind of deal. And you get really what you're paying for. If you some of the stuff that we put in production in our greenhouses, we pay a boatload for the seed, the cost of the seed, but you're getting your broccoli is not the little stringy, crummy, you know, Raya broccoli. Uh, you're getting we 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 seed Marathon, we have seed some broccolis that are great, and cauliflower is the same way. Every cauliflower that you're going to buy out of a box store is going to be early snowball, just because the seed's cheap, and it's a commercial deal. They don't care. They're not going to have to look you in the face year after year. Bottom line is, we, we bring uh, a cauliflower seed called Wentworth out of Canada, and it's a little bit later. You're not going to get cauliflower until, you know, August, late August, but you'll get big old heads of cauliflower. It does better up here. So we actually put a lot into our, our seeding program. Yes? First, a minute, miniature backstory. The trees on our property were planted in 1997, and we have huge, beautiful fruit trees, mm -hmm. and they have never borne fruit one time. <laughs> In, since 1997, and what happens is we get these beautiful blossoms, and then we get a hard freeze. Yeah, then freeze. They freeze. <laughs> now my question is: Is there something I can do? Be, I can't govern the weather. Is there something else I can do that will help my trees? Apple trees, peach yeah. trees, pear trees. Uh, no, move, move, move. 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 Okay. No. Everybody in the room, one, two, three. No. no. <laughs> I, it's interesting. The, the average person is scared to death to prune, and we've allowed a lot of these trees to get huge, exactly what you're alluding to. You can keep an apple tree, you can keep a, a dwarf, you can keep a standard, you can keep a semi-dwarf at bay by pruning. 
And like I say, don't be scared to prune. I would knock those trees back. I almost got a divorce from my wife one time. I took an apple tree in the backyard, took it down to ground zero, and she came out and she goes, what did you do to the tree? And I go, honey, just wait. You know, it flushed out in the spring. It was beautiful. Prune. Keep them pruned. And then if you have the ability to, you know, cover them or... Believe it or not, it sounds odd, but you can put light bulbs in trees and put it on a timer if you're, you know, if you're like me that's a narcoleptic at 8 o'clock, you know, at night and I'm falling asleep. Put it on there so that those lights come on and everywhere you have a light, it'll break, sometimes break that freeze and you can have a cluster of apples. There's one other caveat to that too, is what you just alluded to, Linden, you know, and over here too. Um, we have three beautiful seasons on this mountain. Spring is not one of them. Right. You know, it is always windy and dry. And uh, when I say windy, you know, 60 knot winds. So, you know, most of your flowers are probably at your neighbor's house right. by the end of spring. So, St. John's. That's all I can give you. Well, you know, Chris, one, yes. one year he did a little, like, pseudo smudge pot. Yeah. And it worked. You know, I actually took a, a heater and I put a garbage can lid underneath my apple tree, and that quadrant where that was had apples, huh. where the rest of the tree did not froze. <laughs> We're going to Safeway. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, depending on where you're at, pollinators are an issue too. Oh, that's true. Uh, some people are, really true. are way out in the forest and, and away from different things, or out in the cedars, mm -hmm. and there aren't any bees. And so, depending on where you're at, pollinators could be an issue. You know, it, that's true, very, very true. And we, it's not just honeybees too. We actually have a little tiny thing that's a bumblebee looking thing, and they do an incredible job of pollinating. And uh, I had a gal that came in the nursery, and she goes, she says, I need to kill these things. I want them whacked, I want to kill them. And I go, and I'm a beekeeper, and I go, I'm not selling you anything. And she was absolutely, I'd lost a customer, she was hacked off at me, her girlfriend was hacked off at me, but I go, uh -uh, I'm not selling you anything. Because they're gonna gun and spray, you can spray carbaryl on a tree and you can whack bees in a heartbeat. So I'm one, I'm a little bit green, believe it or not, and I don't like doing that kind of stuff. So I don't know if this is a social media thing, but for some of the pan plants that we buy from like Home Depot or Lowe's, are they already treated with a pesticide or no? Is that just like a... can't answer it. I don't know what their programs oh, are. Okay. But my trade journals have beat them up pretty good on neonicotinoids. You know, yes. uh, amidacloclopril, that's one that uh, um, they're talk. If, but I think that there's so much pressure in the industry that they're starting to back away from oh. that. Their, their programs are... Or right. geared so maybe they're not I can't answer we're we don't spray a lot you know until I get you know fat juicy green aphids in the middle of pepper plants you know that I'm producing then maybe I'll come in and, and lightly zap them and I try to use something that's pretty benign you know but uh, yeah we I don't like to spray a lot of pesticides right. well, sometimes you have to mm -hmm. and so like for those grubs Yes. Do, are they killing all of our plants when they're in the soil? Yeah. And so what do we they do about chickens? Oh, chickens, chickens, right? <laughs> well, um, there's, there's a couple products on the market that will ace them that are not systemic, that are not going to translocate into your plants, too. Okay. And they're labeled Is, is that like the little, like a bacteria or something that they eat and, and it kills oh, them? Oh, no, 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 not, not milky thing? spores, no. Oh. Um, but there's, there, oh gosh, the chemical I've, I've got, I, I got a race I had a ton last year that I was just like, once you kind of get them under control, you're, you're okay, usually good. pretty good, yeah. But and I, if you have manures that tend to be, you know, prevalent and, and have them compost them for a couple of years first before you use them, oh, so just put them out longer. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes, what dear. about those horrible green worms that get in the broccoli that you don't <laughs> see until you get ready to eat your broccoli? <laughs> Broccoli. Is that my wife echoing? <laughs> exactly. I eat a few of them. They're okay. <laughs> protein. Yeah, exactly. Yes, there is something, and it is organic. You, you know, Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacteria that uh, uh, that comes in a dust form, dipel. They'll, they'll label it under dipel, and it will paralyze the digestive tract of a caterpillar and will kill those. And um, will it kill snails? Pardon me? No, 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 no. Snails are, snails are, that's, that's off the charts. They are tough. Um, 
I fight them all the time, and you have to napalm snails. I get some snails <laughs> you know, stuff. Eat them. Yeah. Yes, dear. When you use the same thing you were just talking about for the worms you get in corn? Absolutely. Absolutely. So why would you apply that when Probably in the silk state, yes. Yeah. And you can get it in liquid form. You can get it also in a, a powder form, too. So, yep. Yes, dear. You mentioned you would use covers on your fruit trees. Do you have more fruit trees? What kind of covers? Well, you know, I got to tell you, it's just uh, creativity. If you go to a dug on yard sale and you see some old crummy quilts and stuff like that, buy them up. You know, you buy them for a buck or. Could you get like a row cover? You could, but that's. Row covers are great. And here, here's a little FYI, too. Plastic is a terrible insulator, it can freeze right through clear plastic or plastic. Mm -hmm. But if you have a row covers better, if you even get, I like a little thicker, you know, when it's cold, you get a cold night and you know we're going to dip to 28 and I got my tomatoes already planted, I will take and I'll take an old crummy quilt and I'll throw that over the top of them and it saves them. It'll Moving blankets from Harbor Freight. Ah, bingo. Yes, you're correct. And they're on sale right now, $2.99 yeah, for the deal. Yeah, exactly. The bottom line is those old crummy blankets from Harbor Freight, you know, that uh, moving blankets. Excellent for covering tomatoes and stuff. What if you don't know it's going to freeze? On well, your that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Cover them up anyway. Step outside. Yeah. <laughs> that's my turn. Okay. So, because I noticed when I started, when I married him, I noticed there was a pattern. And I was afraid to say anything about it until I heard um, this Apache lady, and she was older. She brought in her, her daughter and grandchildren and stuff. And I heard, I heard her talking to her grandchildren. And she goes, Oh, you can't plant those till the full moon of June. I went, what did you just say? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I had been noticing that it's full moon related, and it, it's, what it is is you shouldn't plant anything tender until after the full moon of June. Well, now, the last full moon before the summer solstice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the summer solstice is around the 21st, 22nd of June. The full moon before that, whenever it, it hits, is usually usually when we'll get a, a change. The weather will dip. And it, it's very, it's pretty reliable. Very. I have to tell you, almost every season. And you get, and it's, the science is five days before, five days after that full moon, it can freeze. So it, it's variable, but it's pretty consistent. Yeah. Here's another thing though, mark this. At 10 p.m., and a young man told me this, at 10 p.m., if it's 50 degrees outside, it's Probably going to freeze that night. Wow. It's 50 degrees. There's a lot of variables there, but yeah. the last yeah, full moon. Yeah, cloud cover makes a difference and all that, but that yeah. last full moon of spring. The last full moon before the summer solstice, put it on your calendar and watch it like a hawk. Because yeah. mm -hmm. we've been here for 42 years, and I'll guarantee you it's frozen more than not. And I've had killing freezes as, in Lakeside as late as the 17th of June. Oh. Yep. That'll wreck your spirits. Now, I live down. I live down south, and down there, everybody watches the pecan trees. When the pecan trees leaf out, right. you can plant your gardeners. Is there well, anything up here like that? Well, yeah, they say the oak trees. They go, you know, if the oak leaves are as big as a squirrel's ear, I have seen the top of my oak tree blackened before. So. Probably a a little more reliable. Yeah, maybe. Yes, sir. Could you just repeat what the what the powder or liquid form was that you said for the worms? The bacteria is Bacillus thuringiensis. They'll label it under BT, or another commercial name is Dipel, like Dipel dust. But it's BT, BT liquid, BT powder. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria. Okay. It's complete. It's uh, uh, biological warfare. has no impact on you whatsoever. Yes, sir. For eight years, we've been tracking... <coughs> The National Weather Service for their forecast for our latitude, longitude, our house, mm -hmm. and the actual what it got down to at night. And now we have a trend and we see how they're always off by that many degrees. Mm -hmm. My point is simply this. We always know at our house that there's a risk of freezing tonight or there's not, cover them or not. And anybody in this room could do that. It's anal, it's a lot of work, but you could do that and get a, history, or get a trend and know to cover your plants. You can do that too. You're absolutely correct. You know, it can be done. The and it's the age-old deal. I'll sit there and go, oh man, I think I'm gonna chance it. You know, this, yeah, you can do that too. This, this lazy boy chair is feeling pretty doggone good right now. And, you know, and that's the night it freezes. So, but you're you're absolutely correct. So the yes. good news is it's early this year. 
So the last full moon before the summer solstice is actually um, May 29th. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a you probably can't answer this, but <laughs> all my green bean plants, I get those little yellow bugs underneath the leaf. Yes. And they lay all their eggs underneath. Is there anybody getting rid of those things? It's probably a precursor. Those are probably eggs. You say yellow bugs? Oh, yeah. They're just yellow and kind of stuff. Aphids. They'll just eat your leaf. No, it's not an aphid. No. Okay. It, it, little it, bitty bugs. Uh, the uh, eggs are yellow, yeah. but the thing, the little bugs are soft and they are uh, bugs, actual bugs. And that's what they look like. So I get in my plants and I just smash all the eggs and I smash the bug when I find them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything that we could put them around them or something that would kill the thing from getting up in there. I don't know whether it's a beetle or not because yeah. it doesn't have a hard shell. Yeah. Is, it a, is it a larval form prior to a beetle? I don't know. No, I, I know what Colorado potato beetles are. Right. And and they have a larva form right. before. Yep, 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 but yep, it's yep. not like that. Okay. Hmm. You can I shake them off on the ground and everything else. I'll bring a few over. Yeah, that's what I need. Actually, in all honesty, just switch. I'm bring a whole bunch. Yeah. 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 Thanks, sunshine. Yeah. 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 I just smash my yeah. yeah. Yes, I, smash my I need to let everybody know that this whole meeting will be on the RVCC website within a few days. So if you want to uh, run it back to any particular thing that uh, uh, Chris has said, it'll be up so that you can you can see it. Yes, dear. Too, I know that um, the work lamps that they put on cars has got the little clip on them. Yes. yes. I looked down in Phoenix and we had golden billions. And we would have to get on the roof mm -hmm. <laughs> and put the breeze cloths down and then put those underneath and it protected them every single time. Hear what she's saying? Yeah. That's actually works. Yeah. You know, if you can tarp, you can just throw something over. Cold comes down. Cold comes down. Okay, if you can tarp the top of a tree and you stick a shop light under there, that heat's going up underneath that deal, underneath your what your your moving blankets, your crummy quilts, you know, even tarps. Bottom line is that heat's under there and it's enough to sometimes let your trees sneak through and get fruit. I'm pointing at you if, if that was the question. I thought that's where it came from. But, uh, but that actually works. Yeah. Say what? It's good for keeping your pipes from freezing. Oh. <laughs> yes, dear. Two, two uh, insect issues. Um, squash bugs. Mm -hmm. And um, I have every year at the very end of the season when strawberries are still...